My name is Paul Schreiber. Um, I am the lead developer at 538. We're a data journalism website based in New York City. We cover sports, politics, news, science, economics, and so on. When I'm not building websites for 538, I like to watch hockey. I'll ride around on my bicycle. I run a concert series out of my living room. I like to talk about all of these things, but today I'm here to talk about HTTPS. So HTTP is dead. It has served us well, but its time has come and passed. You're saying, well, Paul, that's great that you're telling me this. You're up on stage, but who are you? And why should I listen to you? Well, if you don't want to listen to me, you can listen to the Chrome team. The Chrome team has said, we are going to mark HTTP as affirmatively non-secure. So in the past, you go to a website, it looks one way. You go to a secure website, you get a lock. You go to a secure website with a problem, you get an error. In the future, when you go to a non-encrypted website, you will see the same type of markings indicating the site is not secure. The Mozilla team, they've said the same thing. Hey, look, in Firefox in the future, we are going to deprecate non-secure HTTP. They said that if, when they build new features into Firefox, they will only be available on HTTPS connections. And they are going to phase out access to browser features, especially ones that are, use user information for non-secure connections. Now, people typically have said, oh, well, HTTPS is important for information that's private or information that's sensitive. And then you get into long debates about what's private and what's sensitive. But the US government says, forget that. All browsing activity is private and sensitive. The United States government has standardized on HTTPS for its own executive branch websites. So we talked, to, he mentioned the New York Times last year. The folks at the Times said, hey, if you run a new site or if you run any site at all, I have a challenge. Make a commitment to have your site fully on HTTPS by the end of 2015 and pledge your support with this hashtag. I thought that was great and I went to work. And I started to figure out what happens when you don't use HTTPS. Well, if you don't use HTTPS, rogue internet providers start popping up ads on your screen. These are not ads from your advertisers and they're going to make your advertisers pretty unhappy. Airlines do this. So you owe an obligation of integrity to your advertisers who are paying you to put their ads there and not someone else's. The next thing, if you still are using HTTP, that means all of the information is transmitted in the clear. And anyone who is listening in between you and the server, they can see what you're looking for. If you use HTTPS, it's all encrypted. If they eavesdrop, this is what they'll see. Next, security. When you have a web page, not only does it have the content of your page, it also loads a lot of external resources. And if those external resources are loaded over HTTP, they can be intercepted and redirected, and they can be used to attack your own site. This is what happened at GitHub. Someone took an external JavaScript and used it to perform a denial of service attack on them. And finally, HTTP is slow. It was designed in 1991. In 1991, there were no cable modems. There, were no, there was no DSL. There were no multi-core processors. It was built for a different time. So we have HTTP2 today. And HTTP2 requires HTTPS. If you want the speed, if you want the performance of HTTP2, you need to be using HTTPS. So what does the S stand for? Well, in my world, the S stands for hope. Hope for a better web. So there are six things I'm going to talk to you about today when it comes to HTTPS. We'll discuss certificates and what they are and how you go about buying one. We'll talk about how to configure your web server to use HTTPS. We'll talk about making sure once your server's up and running under HTTPS, how, to make, how all your content will still work. We'll discuss briefly how much this will cost. We'll talk a little bit more about performance. And finally, we'll go through how I solved some of the problems I ran into when getting this 538 working on HTTPS. So certificates. Certificates are what tell the web browser that you are who you say you are, that you're WordPress.org, not somebody else pretending to be WordPress.org. And the most basic certificate covers a single domain. So you buy a certificate, covers example.com, you're done. You can also buy a certificate that'll work with multiple domains. This is helpful if you're in the hosting business 
and you have a lot of unrelated domains, you could have example.com, greeneggsandham.info, wordpressfan.biz, all in one certificate. It's a little less, so you only have one of these to manage, a whole bunch of domains. This is also called a SAN certificate. SAN is subject alternative name. If you're shopping and you see something that says UCC or Unified Communications, same idea. And lastly, there's a wildcard certificate. This lets you use unlimited subdomains for any one domain. So example.com, beta.example.com, shoebox.example.com, and so on. A thing to note about wildcard certificates is they only work for one level of subdomains at a time. So if you had www.beta.example.com, that same certificate wouldn't work. In doing research for this talk, I, I went out and looked at some different certificate vendors. And having done this for a while, I thought I'd seen most of what there was, but I ran into something strange. I saw something called an SGC certificate. SGC stands for Server Gated, Great Gated Cryptography. And I'm like, huh, that's weird. I've never heard of that. Is that something new and fancy? And it's not. This is something really old. In the 1990s, the United States government considered cryptography to be a munition. It was a weapon, just like tanks. And they had export limitations on cryptography. So old web browsers, they came in two flavors. They came in a domestic flavor and an international flavor. And the international flavors only used 40-bit encryption. But the people doing commerce on the internet said, oh, that's not good enough. And so we want to be able to use the full 128-bit encryption. So they had these weird certificates that could work sometimes as 40-bit, sometimes as 128-bit. But these stopped being useful when Internet Explorer 5 went away. And Netscape 4.7.3 was the last time Netscape supported these. I bet you a lot of people in this room were not using the internet when Internet Explorer 5 was still around. So if you see one of these for sale, do not buy it. It is of no use to you whatsoever. And if someone is trying to sell it to you, you should probably not do business with them because they're probably also trying to sell you other things you don't need. So we've now figured out what domains we want to buy a cert for. And we need to, when we buy a certificate, we have to show that we actually have some control over that domain. They won't just give me a certificate for Microsoft.com, for example. So the basic way that's done is what's called domain validation. You say, I own, in my case, say, paulsharber.com. And they say, prove it. And I say, I can answer emails there, or I can change the DNS record there. Great. There's another level of validation you don't see very often called organization validation that says, I own this entity for the company. I'm, you know, I have control over it in some way. Perhaps I'm, I own the company or I'm a signing officer. There's some more paperwork for that. And then the lastly, there's something called extended validation, where they do some checking into your background and into the company's background to show that it really exists and it's at some physical location where you say it is and so on. And if you pay them the money for this, this is when you get to see the green bar in your browser. It shows up in everyone's UI that says, hey, here's the name of the company in addition to the domain name. All right. So now we know what we need about certificates. Let's go shopping. Uh, it turns out buying a certificate is a bit like buying a car. There are a lot of people selling you a lot of different things. Um, there's one company. They have a lot of different brands. And the prices vary tremendously. Sometimes there's a high-end model. costs a lot more and doesn't do too much. There are hundreds of different certificate authorities out there. If you go to buy one, you'll probably buy one from one of the you know, top five or six companies. So Digicert is one of them. Uh, Komodo is another, and they sell things like Positive SSL or Essential SSL or Instant SSL. Uh, Symantec, they're the general motors of certificates because not only do they sell you things named Symantec, which used to be VeriSign, they will sell you GeoTrust, and GeoTrust has a sub-brand called Rapid SSL, and they also bought Thought, so the Thought certificates, these are all coming from Symantec. Um, GoDaddy, who is here in addition to being a hosting provider, turns out they're also a certificate authority. They will sell them to you as well. Now, in addition to buying them directly from the CA, you can buy them from a reseller. And typically, buying them from a reseller will get you a better deal. So if you go to SSLs.com, you will find these same certificates much cheaper. There's another tool called SSL Mate. And it is a command line tool that lets you install, configure, buy, and renew certificates all from your server. They sell these to you for about 16 bucks. And lastly, there's a great project sponsored by a bunch of folks, including the Electronic Frontier Foundation, called Let's Encrypt. And Let's Encrypt says, hey, everybody should get a certificate for free. That means you can, not only can you get a certificate, you can get as many certificates as you want for as long as you want at no cost. 
This is probably the, going to have the most impact on the web since the web standards project. So let's take a look at a pricing summary. So again, uh, here's some domain validation certificates, all the same one, or, or sorry, three different ones. So the Komodo is positive SSL, $49. Their Komodo SSL one, $99. Thoughts certificate, the SSL 123 branded one, $149. Talked about resellers. So we go, we just look at that positive SSL one. We can get it from SSLmate for 16 bucks. We get it from SSLs.com for $9. And here's a broader comparison of all kinds of certificates, not just the typical domain validated one you'll buy. You can spend as much as $1,400 for an extended validation certificate from Symantec. You can get one for free from Let's Encrypt. Uh, if you are going to spend $1,400, come talk to me. I have lots of things I can do with the money. All right, so we bought a certificate, great. Now we need to go and we want to configure our server. And cryptographers, they have a saying, they say you shouldn't try and implement your own crypto system because you're probably going to do it wrong. Well, I have a corollary which says you tr shouldn't try and configure your own web server's cryptography because it's complicated, it's messy, it changes all the time, it's easy to mess up. So what should you do instead? Well, I mentioned SSLmate earlier, and even if you don't use it to buy any of your certificates, you can still install it and use its make config command to generate the right configuration for your web server, Apache, Nginx, your mail server like Dovecot or Postfix, your database, whatever you need. It'll do the right thing. Similarly, the Mozilla folks have a web-based configuration tool, and it will help you configure not only the right server, but the right version of the right server. So if you have Apache 2.4, it'll show you one set of configuration directives, and if you have Apache 2.2, it'll show you the right ones for that. Now, this is a WordPress conference. And the good news is some folks are hard at work at making a WordPress plugin for Let's Encrypt, which means shortly you'll be able to do things like this. You'll get to use the WordPress CLI, a tool you are already familiar with, to install and manage your certificates. So when you set up domains, boom. And just after the Let's Encrypt public beta was announced, the folks at DreamHost says, hey, free certificates, that's awesome. We're totally going to support that. You want a free certificate? We will set it up for you. And in a few months, they'll put it in their UI so everybody will do it. And they're hoping in the future, according to their blog entry, that it'll just be the default soon. So what does it mean to turn on HTTPS for your server? It can mean one of four things. Just having HTTPS enabled says that your readers have the choice of going to your site over HTTP or going to your site over HTTPS. Whatever they type in, they're going to get. Once you're sure that's up and running, the next step is to turn on HTTPS by default. So if they type in HTTP, you'll redirect them to the secure version of their site. And that's pretty good. But a malicious intruder on your network can still intercept that request because it's transmitted in the clear and redirect them somewhere else. So the way you solve this problem is by using something called HSTS, or Hypertext Strict Transport Security. This Tell, this is a header that your server sends that says, hey browser, only request my site securely and always request my site securely. So you do this and you don't have to worry about those sort of intercepted redirects. Once you're sure this is working, you submit your site to the HSTS preload list. This is a list of domain names that the browser makers share that say, oh, these sites are always and only secure, and it doesn't matter if they forget to type the S, just ignore that, always go to the secure version of the site. Another thing you need to know about when configuring servers is something called SNI, or server name indication. This is important when you're doing virtual hosting with HTTPS. This says, hey, I can have one IP address, I can have a bunch of domains, and they can have a bunch of certificates, and I'm good to go. But if you have really old clients, if you have Internet Explorer on Windows XP prior to Service Pack 3, if you have Python prior to Python 2.7, if you have like Android 2, they don't support this. And if these are an important part of your reader base, you need to use a dedicated IP address for that domain name. Another thing to know about is certificate signing with hashes. So they're signed cryptographically with a SHA hash. And there's SHA-1 is a cryptographic standard, uh, and the people started thinking about it, and they started attacking it. And it turned out 
it's vulnerable. So there's a much better thing called SHA-2 or SHA-256. You use this. This, and you want to make sure that all of your certificates that you have already, ones you may have bought in the past, have been reissued to be signed with SHA-2. Chrome has already started warning you if you use a SHA-1 cert that expires in 2016, you'll get the sort of gentle warning. If you have one that expires in 2017 or later, you'll get the red line that says, hey, this is insecure, you know, don't be doing this. Certificates are valid for a fixed amount of time. Typically a year, although Let's Encrypt certificates are now valid for 90 days. You need to remember to renew these. If you don't, your user will go to the site, they'll get a very scary looking warning that says this is expired, don't go here. So make sure to mark on your calendar sometime before your certificate expires that you need to go out and renew it. All right, certificates installed. Server is configured. I've got a whole bunch of content out there. What do I want to do? What's it going to look like? If I go to a typical website, say I go to 538 today, We'll say, hey, this is a site. Eh, can't tell you too much about it. If I go to the secure version of it, I get the nice little padlock. It says it's encrypted. It says it uses modern cryptography. Great. But what if some of the content on the page is not transmitted over HTTPS? Well, Chrome will start to warn you. Notice how the S is still there, but the lock has gone away and been replaced by a plain document icon. And it says, hey, your content uh, your connection to 538 is encrypted, but there's some resources that aren't. So we need to go about fixing this. So you'll, you can see both warnings and errors. A warning is for passive content, something like an image or an audio file where the browser says, eh, shouldn't be not encrypted, probably not going to cause me any trouble, I'll load it anyway. If it sees active content, a style sheet, some JavaScript, and you're on a secure site and that, that active content, not scary, will refuse to load it. But the good news is most of the content you want to embed already available over HTTPS. If you're embedding documents from Document Cloud or Scripty, videos from Vimeo or YouTube, tweets, Vines, Instagram's already all on HTTPS, which is terrific. Unfortunately, some of the other media companies out there have not yet made their players embeddable over HTTPS. So if you need to embed things like video players from the New York Times or Major League Baseball, or audio players from NPR, you can't yet do that on an HTTPS site. We're hopeful that this will happen soon. Good news is though, commenting systems, Facebook, Discuss, all these things work on HTTPS. Ad systems, also working on HTTPS. This is a big stumbling block for most people, and this is why we haven't turned it on by default. Not all of our ads are HTTPS. But the Internet Advertising Bureau, sort of the trade organization for the ad industry, the people you would think would be against this are for HTTPS. They issued a big call to action saying, get on it. They, then they issued a second thing saying, oh, ad blockers. Oh, maybe we kind of screwed up. And we're going to need to encrypt our ads too. That way people will trust us a bit. So there's a push coming from their side, it's a push coming from you on the content side. Your social widgets, great. They're supporting HTTPS. All of your analytics tools, Comscore, Google, Nielsen, Optimizely, Chartbeat, already support HTTPS. If you use a content delivery network, they support HTTPS. Some of them won't even charge you more for using HTTPS, like Cloudflare or Amazon. Akamai charges more, Fastly charges more, You'll have to go and talk to your rep there and, and figure out the pricing. Web fonts, web fonts, HTTPS, already working. No additional work for you. So what are the costs? Well, certificates. Right now, as of December 3rd, certificates, free. What a deal. CDNs, we talked about that. Mostly, you're not paying more. Sometimes you are, maybe a third more. Uh, if you have a server that you run on your own, you're going to have to pay your systems team to go and set it up. And, keep it up to date with patches and so on. You're going to have to work with your editorial staff so they know that when they're embedding things, that they embed the secure version of the content and they link to secure sites. Other than that, sort of business as usual price-wise. Now performance. If you've been around a while and you look up HTTP performance, you might find something on Stack Overflow from 2008 that says, whoa, HTTPS, kind of slow, not sure you should be using it. Good news is we're no longer in 2008. That's no longer true. <laughs> so I mentioned HTTP 2.0 is out. HTTP 2.0 is a lot faster. HTTP 2.0 requires HTTPS. 
I did a quick test with a site called loadimpact.com and they sampled wordpress.org under HTTP 1 and HTTP 2. They found it was 1.88 times faster just for updating the server. No changes on your application side. HTTPS, HTTP 2, fast. Good deal. So we talked about the warnings and errors from mixed content. These are the problems that you have to solve. So you don't want to go through all tens or hundreds or thousands of pages on your site manually. There's a handy tool called Mixed Content Scan. You feed it your URL, it will crawl up for you and it will spit out a report saying, hey, here are the things that aren't HTTPS. Uh, that's great. Um, one, if you have a lot of legacy content, it could take you a while to upgrade. And if you don't want to wait before turning on HTTPS, there's something called a content security policy. The browser makers have added a header that says, oh yeah, just because the URL is HTTP, my server, it already supports HTTPS, so can you rewrite it for me while I get around to that? So they'll request all of those things over HTTPS for you without you changing every image and other embed in your site, which is terrific. Another great content security policy header is for reporting. So that means when folks are out there in the wild, regular readers of your site go there, the browser, when it hits an insecure request, will send a note to your special reporting URL that says, hey, you know, a reader over here tried to read your article and found this problem, you should go fix it. So you'll get this great log, boom. Okay, so you've done all these things, but some of the stuff's not under your control. There are third party assets you're trying to embed. What do you do? Well, step one is you can just ask. And sometimes that works really well. So I talked to the folks at placehold.it or the folks at SoundSite or the folks at Outbrain and said, hey, I'm building an HTTPS site, some of your stuff doesn't work. And they said, oh yeah, no problem, we'll fix that for you. Uh, if you have an Akamai site and you haven't got a certificate up, a lot of times you can rewrite the Akamai URL or other URLs like it uh, to include the host name later on. That works pretty well. Uh, the folks at HTTPS Everywhere, which have a huge map of these out there for you. Uh, another thing to be aware of is protocol relative URLs. This was a great idea a while ago. It's now considered sort of an anti-pattern. So if you have script or image or font assets that are being loaded with slash slash, switch them to use the HTTPS version of your URL. That will work even on an HTTP page. It means you're ready for when you do upgrade. The only exception to this is with iframes, because if your iframe needs to communicate with your main site, the protocols have to match. So you can use protocol relative URLs for iframes. HTTPS Everywhere has a Chrome extension. It's generally designed for users to protect their privacy, but it's great for developers because it will log all of the insecure requests and give you a quick report for you. So, you want a website that ensures the integrity of your author's content. You want a website that shows the ads that you're being paid to show. You want a website that is fast. You want to do all of this and with one thing. You do that with HTTPS. Thank you so much. All right, great. If you have some questions, please walk up to the mic in the middle aisle. I was uh, wondering about uh, any technical difficulties with switching from a non-HTTP site to uh, a secure site in terms of SEO. So the, the good news is that Google sees HTTPS as a positive indicator and will rank your site more highly for being HTTPS. Uh, when you are transitioning from the non-secure site to the secure site, uh, you, want to, you, you want to go into Google Webmaster Central and make sure you claim the secure version of your site as, in addition. Uh, you will want to set up canonical URLs uh, in the link rel equals canonical to point at the secure version and, and make sure that that's the definitive version. You want to have the redirects in. You want to have 301 redirects. You, want to have HS, you might want to have HSTS on. HS, yeah, TS on. So that folks are only going to the one version. The problems occur when you have two versions live at the same time uh, and you know, you're, people are linking to both and Google is crawling both. Yeah. Next, hi. Hey, how's it going? Good, what's uh, your name? My name is Robert. Hi, uh, Robert. <laughs> how's it going? I'm a big fan. 
Woohoo! My nerd follower. Anyway, uh, I had a question about SNI. I wanted to see um, if you guys are leveraging it at 538 or at the Times or any other of the institutions you work with, and also um, what your experience is like it with users reporting, I guess, negative experience with it. We use it, I, I'm a part of a hosting company, and we leverage it to great success without very much user complaint, but I wanted to see like on a larger scale what uh, your experience or uh, what your experience is with sure. it. Sure. So I have nothing to do with the New York Times. I don't work with them or for them, and I haven't in the past, so apologies if you're confused by the introduction. Uh, I'm not sure what they use. Uh, 538 is hosted by WordPress VIP. They take care of all of that. Uh, I think I see somebody in the back who's very excited. It must be a VIP person. Hi. Uh, and we're happy with them. They, I believe they use SNI as well because it's a shared environment and they don't set up separate IPs for us. Um, we haven't turned it on by default, so we haven't received any reader complaints because the only people who use it so far are people who you know, deliberately type it in or use HTTPS everywhere. Um, so in terms of real world complaints, I can't tell you much. You want to look at your logs uh, from Google Analytics or Omniture or whatever you're using, see what your browser share is. Uh, if you have a lot of, say, weird corporate customers who got stuck on XP still, or you have people using really old Android, then you'll, you'll want to make a different decision. But the way you make that decision is you look at your traffic and see what percent of your readers don't support SNI, and is that a big enough number that's important to you? Thank you. Hi. Hi, quick question on the free certificates. Uh, why are they only 90 days instead of a year? Ah, so this is it. one of the things about certificates is if there's a problem with them in the past, you've had to issue a revocation. And the revocation stuff has never worked really well. Um, and browsers are supposed to check, but those checks sometimes time out, so you couldn't really guarantee it. And they said, well, one way to prevent this problem from occurring in the future is to make all these certificates short term. Uh, so that way, the likelihood of a bad certificate being used in the wild for a long time is much lower. And the, the Let's Encrypt client is set up to automatically, you can set up to automatically renew these things. And the idea is not that you have to remember every 89 days to do something on your own. Cool. Hi. You mentioned a problem with sites that have lots of embeds that can't be embedded through HTTPS. Yes. Um, suppose you're running a site and you have a bunch of old embeds which can't be upgraded. Yeah. How would you approach that issue? Would you serve some pages as HTTP if you can't? Well, so do you control the content of the embeds, or they're third-party embeds? Uh, no, they're, well, they're in post content, but they can't be upgraded because it might be an ABC embed or something. So Yeah. Um, can, you, can you bring the mic taller for the next person? So it sounded like he said that there's some content. They can't upgrade it. Uh, what are they going to do about the mixed content warnings? So one workaround you could employ is to use a, a proxy server that would sit in between your reader uh, and the insecure content, which would read it for them and return it on HTTPS. So if you can't, if you can't migrate it at all, uh, that's sort of your, your best bet, is to set up a proxy. Next. Hi. Um, I'm in a similar situation to yours with, yep. Sorry. <laughs> uh. Uh, with a uh, news site uh, hosted on VIP hosting. Um, and we also ran into the problem where we couldn't bully all of our uh, advertisers into doing uh, HTTPS only. Um, and I was, we had in prep for moving to HTTPS put in a lot of uh, relative schema URLs. I was wondering yeah. if you knew anything um, specific that's a negative on that, other than it's out of popularity. Uh, so the re the Protocol relative URLs aren't really any worse than using plain HTTP. But if you can use HTTPS URLs, even if your site isn't, you should, because that ensures at least those resources are loaded securely, and you can say something about the integrity of them. Um, and uh, it was interesting that yeah, you talked about the advertisers. I think the Washington Post is the first major publication to support, to support HTTPS on their site. One of the things they did was they actually went and sold some advertising that says this site's secured by, and they got that sponsored, which helped them pick up some ad revenue uh, to make up for the loss of a couple of, of 
old sort of ne ne ad network kind of revenue that they didn't control. Like with the big spot, the big advertisers, like we have an internal ad ops group that, that manages that. But when stuff gets not sold and is distributed by an ad network where we have less, that's when we lose control over the, whether it's distributed over HTTP or HTTPS. So protocol relative URLs, um, if you have a non-secure site, you can still use them. If you can upgrade those, do it now, because it'll save you time later. Um, and uh, see if you can convince your salespeople it's an opportunity to sell new stuff. Okay, thank you. I also wanted to mention that there is another place for getting uh, free and inexpensive uh, certificates. Uh, it's been around since 2004, uh, Start SSL. Yes, so and I have used Start SSL as well. Uh, it's clunky. Uh, their UI, and they make you obtain your own certificate in, in your browser and save it. And uh, so if you're a sysadmin, you could do it, but you don't really need to anymore because Let's Encrypt is so much easier to use. Um, and they also, Let's Encrypt will, Star Starcom wouldn't let you revoke certs. They would charge you a fee for that. Uh, and you don't have that problem where with Let's Encrypt, you can sort of reissue any time. Yeah, cool. Any more questions? No, I don't see any. Thank you all again.